Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, it's a real delight um, for the Staff Pride Network uh, to be able to host um, online uh, when we can uh, host in person and not only to host events for you to join us, but also uh, to record and for people to be able to watch back. Um, where in the past they perhaps would have liked to have joined us, uh, now they can um, afterwards. So um, that's, that's a, very pleasing to be able to do. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the Staff Pride Network, uh, we uh, work uh, to support LGBT plus uh, staff and PhD students and uh, work with the students uh, Pride Sock and the LGBT plus uh, uh, the liberation officers uh, the youth as well um, and work with the university um, more widely at a professional level and uh, departments uh, different departments to support them in their equality, diversity, inclusion initiatives uh, so it's a really exciting um position to be in as co-chair. Uh, um, my name is Jonathan McBride. My pronouns are he, him. I will say thank you very much to uh, Robbie behind the scenes uh, tonight who has set up the Zoom and is making sure everything runs smoothly. To Siobhan uh, who has really put so much time and effort uh, to organising this event. Uh, we're very grateful um, to uh, Jen Durkin, who uh, is hiding as a guest uh, here. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Jen is in the University of Edinburgh Bio Quarter um, LGBT Plus Staff Committee. Uh, and uh, finally, to all of our guests, uh, and you can see in the order there, uh, Alistair, the new chief exec at HRE Scotland, Professor Roy Robertson and uh, Christopher Ward at Waverley Care. And uh, you will, I'll pass over to Siobhan to introduce the first speaker as well. <laughs> So hello, um, I'm uh, Siobhan Carroll, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm here with multiple hats on, uh, but the two primary ones are as an events and socials officer for the Staff Pride Network and as um, the co-chair of the Disabled Staff Network. Last month, we ran an event on that was a Wikipedia editathon on the history of HIV in Scotland. And so this companion event is to look not just at the history, but at the future for Scotland. And that's what we're going to hopefully look at today. So we're going to start with the person that I wrote an article on at the Wikipedia Editathon. Unfortunately, last year, the activist, lawyer and by all accounts, wonderful human Derek Ogg died. Um, so we have not been able to have him here as a speaker. But thanks to the wonderful Jane Valentine at Our Story Scotland, what we do have is 10 minutes of audio of him describing the moments when he first became aware of what was first called GRID, gay-related immune disease, and later became known as HIV AIDS. So I will pass you to the charming sound of Derek. At about this time in 1980, I was aware that from reading the American press, the gay press, which I'd never got out of the habit of doing because there was always so much great debate and great writing and great writers, famous writers, Gord Vidal and so on, writing in, in regular endings. And um, I became aware from one of the San Francisco, I think it was from the way from the advocate, um, of a pneumonia that was particularly seemed to be going around in the gay community and they thought it might be something to do with some kind of uh, parasite in the bathhouses uh, which is a big culture, the saunas as we would call them um, in, in California 
uh, and it seemed to be taking a, a lot of people seemed to be dying. There was all clusters of people dying, and the, the centers for disease control were saying, you know, when you get clusters like that, it's usually because of some kind of viral activity of some sort. But nobody could find out what it was, and it started to get reported more and more and more. Um, and uh, so I was just keeping an eye on it. Um, it was interesting that something that was happening over there. Um, and then eventually there was one edition which talked about something called GRID, G-R-I-D, Gay Related Immune Deficiency. Uh, and this was because it just seemed to be that it was gay people who were having this, and it seemed to be that their immune systems had crashed. Um, and beyond that, no one knew anything. So for a good while, it was called GRID, Gay Related Immune Deficiency. And then they found that, that, that there was a particular sort of group of Ashkenazi Jews that for some reason were susceptible uh, to it and they thought it might be related so and then they found that there was quite a lot of clusters in Haiti um, as well and so they, they, they just couldn't make sense of this it was a syndrome in other words it wasn't one specific disease that was killing someone it, they were having lots of different diseases but with this same classical depression of the immune, immune system so um, and, and for, a, for a number of years it's been great controversy about what actually caused AIDS um, and it was eventually discovered to be uh, something that was first called HTLV3, human T-cell lymphocyte virus number three, um, from an African green monkey of all things. Um, and I remember being in a nightclub called Fire Island in Princess Street in Edinburgh, 127 Princess Street, Edinburgh. It used to be the international club. My very best friends, uh, Jimmy Rocchio uh, and Davina Rocchio, owned and ran it. Uh, and Bill Granger um, had approached him saying he had a gay disco he'd like to, to rent the two nights it wasn't open as a straight disco, to put a gay disco in. And this was called Fire Island. And Jimmy said, yeah, I'll go ahead then. The um, place isn't open on those nights, so I'll open it. You can get the door money, I'll get the bar money. And gradually, Jimmy had trouble with being in Princess Street, uh, with you know, fighting and people and the licensing police saying there's too much fighting going on in your premises. So Jimmy said, well, look, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to turn it completely gay. And said to Bill Granger, let's make this completely gay. Um, that way we have less fighting. Um, and um, uh, I can still sell my money, uh, my, my drinks. Um, and so that's what happened. So it became a big hub, a major hub. Uh, and everyone, everyone went to Fire Island, by the way, divine... Um, Shirley Bassey, Ethica, everyone uh, went, went there, big groups went there as entertainment. Um, and so it was a big social hub, and I remember being there one night, um, not long after the law reform, we were all celebrating the law reform, of course, creating new confidence about where we were going, but also conscious that this thing was happening in the United States, and I thought this is going to come here, whatever it is, because we had this um, transatlantic bridge through something called Laker Airways, which was the first ever budget airline, hundred pounds return to New York, and I thought it's it's not going to be long. I mean, I know how viruses work. It's not going to be long before that gets over here. And um, I'd been talking with um, people like Sandy McMillan, Dr. Sandy McMillan, who's a consultant at the VD clinic as it was then in Edinburgh, who was also, you know, researching this. And so I was touching base with him. Uh, about it and I was extremely well informed and I think I was one of, at one time I was one of about nine people in Britain including doctors um, who knew what was coming down the track at us we realised this was an epidemic and we knew nothing about it and we didn't even know what to call it and uh, so we set up down in England a guy um, called Terence Higgins, um, had got this virus and he died. And his, his friends and loved ones set up an information charity about it. Um, and a uh, gay switchboard in England had a meeting announcing the formation of Terence Higgins uh, Trust. And um, we went down to that and came back from it. And uh, then in my kitchen one night I had um, Edward McGough and John Ramage who were both stalwarts of Edinburgh Gay Switchboard, gay counselling line. Uh, they came across uh, to Dunfermline. At that time I'd set up a law practice in the High Street in Dunfermline and I had a flat above it in the High Street. 
and uh, they came um, over with Nigel Cook, who would be, was the treasurer for SHRG, um, and we needed somebody, if we were going to do what I wanted to do, we, we'd need someone who'd be a treasurer, we'd need people who knew about penciling and caring and so on. Edward also had, a, a Edward and John also had an old folks home, a nursing home, not an old folks home. And, and John was a, also a trained district nurse. So we had a kind of medical care, social care, counselling and uh, uh, um, financial all in the one kitchen. And I, and I laid it all out, newspapers out and so on, meetings that were taking place at Case Switchboard in London. And I said, we need to do something in Scotland uh, that is particularly Scottish because we had a different kind of setup in Scotland. It was also easier to do things in Scotland because it's a smaller country. So um, we agreed then to set up something we laboured over the name Scottish AIDS Monitor, we decided, because we didn't have any um, AIDS in Scotland at this point. So we actually set up the organisation to meet this threat before it actually landed on our shores. He was able to get a grant for £6,000 to set up something which would be members of the gay community talking to the gay community. Because for those who don't know, um, sex between men up until 1980-ish was illegal in Scotland and punishable. And in fact, in the context of this audio, the law, law, legal reform that he's talking about celebrating in Fire Island is the legal reform allowing that to be decriminalised. So um, I'd just like to thank Jane Valentine from Our Story Scotland, who recorded this interview for allowing us to share it. Um, it's going to be available in the National Archives if you want to hear the whole recording, which I really recommend because the work that Derek did is just fascinating. Um, as I said, I have been drafting his Wikipedia entry and the more I find out about it, the more in awe I am. And from that, um, that's our first speaker. So he's given us a bit of the setting um, that the uh, sex between men had finally been decriminalized. There were fantastic gay clubs like Fire Island, uh, but there was this looming threat, which people who've watched re the recent show on Channel 4, More 4 and HBO in America, everyone is talking about it's a sin. Um, and at this point, I would like to ask Christopher, who's happy to, Christopher from Waverly Care, who has said that he's happy to talk not just to It's a Sin and what that's about, but to what Waverly Care, how Waverly Care started in response to the crisis in the 80s. Christopher. Hello, thank you so much. Um, yep, yeah, my name's Christopher, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm a health improvement coordinator with Waverly Care. So I'm going to talk a bit about It's a Sin, but also, as Siobhan said, what Waverly Care was doing in response to the crisis that had appeared in Edinburgh in the 80s as well. So it might seem hard to believe that It's a Sin is the first British TV drama to focus solely on the HIV and AIDS crisis that decimated communities in the UK in the 80s. And I think this series does a fantastic job of really painting that landscape where opinions of the time, homophobia, as well as the fear of a new virus um, caused a lot of panic in different communities across the UK. But it was also useful that Russell T Davis, the writer, ensured that we also recognise the joy and the unity and the exciting sexual experiences of the people that fought to survive during this period. Uh, one of the key characters in the series, It's a Sin, is Ollie Alexander's character, Richie. And we see him move from a small community to a big city and I feel that that's a story that's all too familiar with LGBT plus people across the world. For Richie, after he comes out to his friends, he really comes into his sexuality, really builds on his confidence and his sex life and his relationships, and then this crisis unfolds. Now, the story of um, coming out and moving to big cities is one that's common in Scotland, with gay centres set up in Edinburgh in 1975 and in Glasgow in 1977, we see communities begin to change the narrative about what it means to be LGBT in Scotland in the following years. Now, in regards to HIV, according to the Lothian Health Service Archive, Edinburgh's first case of HIV was diagnosed in 1983. 
which was the same year that Derek Ogg helped set up the Scottish AIDS monitor that Siobhan had mentioned before. And as the decades went on, the city's high infection rates that was nearly times, seven times higher than the national average meant the region was really at the forefront of the battle against this virus. Now It's a Sin focuses on the impacts of HIV and AIDS on gay communities in London, and it does a fantastic portrayal of this. Someone who's written quite a lot about this recently was Chris Cregan, who lost his partner to AIDS during the 1980s as well. And he says about It's a Sin that this is our story, and it could be the story of me, it could be the story of my partner Lawrence and of our friends, and what it really does is give a voice to those who didn't make it. Now, to come back to Edinburgh in the 80s, Waverley Care was set up in 1989 to build the UK's first purpose-built AIDS hospice in response to the growing epidemic in Edinburgh. And during these times, they had to battle with the realities and health concerns of HIV and AIDS, including the stigma and fear that surrounded it. And in 1994, uh, Scottish AIDS Monitor set up Gay Men's Health, which was the UK's first dedicated health initiative for gay and bisexual men in the UK. So with the advent of new treatments in 1996, it shifted a work of focus for Waverley Care towards helping people live longer with HIV. So the services like Milestone became about respite rather than palliative care. And by 2002, we were developing future projects that were aimed about improving health and helping people to make future plans. Now within Waverley Care, I work for Essex, which was established in 2000. 2016 built on the activism through the years to address the health inequalities of gay and bisexual men and all men who have sex with men. Now these included poor mental health, sexual health and today gay and bisexual men still carry the heaviest burden in relation to HIV. But as treatments have meant that people live longer and happier lives, which I think Alistair will go into further, it's time that we think about the virus and how far we've come, but also how far we've got to go. It's a Sin did a fantastic job of portraying these people that fought for our communities to be heard. And there's a fantastic scene in the series that if you've not seen, it really shows the courage and bravery of these people. One of the clearest things to cover as our charity of Waverly Care following It's a Sin was to ensure that people's understanding of what HIV means today is very different. Our treatments for HIV have come on dramatically. However, one thing that has not kept pace with the rate of change is the issue of stigma. And going back to what Chris Cregan had said, he says of the time in the 80s, AIDS wasn't the only killer in our midst. Stigma was no less deadly. One of his closest friends, Tim, died of pneumonia in a bed, alone, undiagnosed, because he'd been too afraid or too ashamed to tell a soul that he feared he had AIDS. Now, stigma continues to be a barrier to accessing treatment, leading to late diagnosis, and education and understanding of what HIV means today is the way we need to change this conversation. But it's important to recognize that HIV doesn't exist in a vacuum. Poor mental health, sexual health, homophobia, transphobia, racism, all contribute to someone's risk of becoming HIV positive. And that's why at Waverly Care, we offer such a variety of services. So these histories are really important to keep alive. And Waverly Care is currently in the process of starting a heritage project to look at the history of HIV and AIDS specifically in Scotland. So I suppose the end of my piece is watch the space. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you, Christopher. Um, it was really interesting to think about how we've, how far we've come and um, not just think of it as a historical moment in time. Um, as Christopher alluded to, Edinburgh was um, a very, Edinburgh had a, highest, a higher rate of AIDS than the rest of the UK, uh, but it also was known as the AIDS capital of Europe. And though it's a sin focused on the um, impact on men who have sex with men, the main driver of the high rates of HIV in Scotland were to do with intravenous drug users and um, primarily heroin. And one of the people who was quite instrumental in getting that recognised and coming up with solutions for it, we are really lucky to have on this panel, and that's uh, Professor Roy Robertson who will possibly cringe because I forgot to change his picture. Professor Robertson. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Yes, I do cringe a bit. Um, I, I probably um, didn't hear then as I do now. Um, I, it's a great privilege and pleasure to talk. I mean, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, 
I, I've got a, a bit of a history lesson, I suppose. Um, I mean, I've been a GP in Edinburgh since 1980, or I was a trainee in 1979 in Northwest Edinburgh, um, and I'm still working in the same practice. So I've been there a long time. And during that time, it's been a great pleasure and privilege and, you know, delightful to work with all sorts of people, including Derek Ogg. It was great to hear him. Um, very sad uh, to not have him here. Um, and to work with a myriad of, of other people that um, I can't possibly name. But uh, so it's been a bit of a, a, a roller coaster over the years. Um, and I mean, my interest in, in the drug using population really became uh, what just happened because it was there. I mean, there were drug users in our practice when I arrived, who we were starting to arrive. And it all started in 1980, really, um, with the arrival of cheap heroin. Um, not just in Edinburgh, but throughout Western Europe, throughout North America. Um, the place was flooded, and it was because of international affairs. It was because of the Islamic Revolution. It was because of trouble in Afghanistan, the Russians invading Afghanistan. And more locally, it was, it, it was exacerbated by our local politics and by Mrs. Thatcher and that hostile government of the 1979 election. Um, Thatcher was elected for the first time in 1979, followed by rapid cutbacks, so fearsome cutbacks in public health and in local services. Uh, social services were cut back 30% in one year. So dramatic things happening, um, causing uh, civil unrest, riots in various cities, um, and into that popped heroin and into that popped our, our crisis of... Um, uh, a first part of the crisis, which was an epidemic of heroin use um, in young people, in people who were unfamiliar with heroin. I mean, heroin had been, of course, um, available in Edinburgh and before the drug people, the drug squad and the police said probably there was about 50 heroin users in Edinburgh in the 1970s. But by 1980, we probably had several thousand. And these were young people, very young people, 17, 18 year olds. Uh, just like school, many of them um, injecting heroin for the first time, not really having much idea of what they were doing, having no injecting equipment, um, giving rise to these to the, the popular term of shooting galleries, um, little groups of people injecting drugs together um, with a supply of extraordinarily pure heroin. Um, and casualties were easy to see. I mean, we had an epidemic of... Um, of uh, hepatitis B infection, um, and that was where our research interest was triggered. We started measuring um, samples. We started taking samples of blood from people to measure their liver function tests and check their health. Um, but, so it was obvious that hepatitis was prevalent in the community, um, and that was noted by public health, but very little active interventions um, took place in the 1980, 81, 82. There was very little in the way of the notion of harm reduction or risk reduction. There were very little in the way of educational in, in, in initiatives. Um, and then, I, I mean, this is against the background of, of things happening elsewhere. I mean, it was obvious, like Derek said, it was obvious that things were happening in North America. And a colleague of mine who'd been, who'd been in my year at university was working in New York at the time. And she told me about the heroin shooting galleries in, in her in her area she was living in in New York City. Um, and we thought, a bit like Derek, we thought, well, it's going to happen here. It's, it's inevitable. There's going to be HIV infection or HDLV3, as it was, caused, it was called by 1985. But we didn't know about that until the test became available. Um, and when the test became available in 1985, and we tested people in the casualty department and later in our practice, it became obvious that we had a high prevalence of HIV infection in our drug using population. So looking back at those old samples, those stored samples from the hepatitis B study, we were able to identify that actually the virus had come into this population probably in 1981, 82, and that it spread very rapidly um, during this period of very active drug use. Um, at the time, it was interesting that we had had no deaths. I mean, the first um, death in a drug user was probably around about 84, 85, uh, who contracted it. 
but the majority of our patients or our individual drug users were still quite well. They were still asymptomatic. At the time, it's, I mean, one of the interesting things about history is looking back, but it's hard to imagine what it was like at the time. Um, but we didn't know, like Derek said, we didn't know about this disease. We didn't know the incubation period. We didn't know how many people might die and how many people might recover or what would be the, the, the pattern of events, what this transmission might be like. Um, so there was a lot of unknowns. Um, and it was very clearly very alarming in our community. Uh, but it wasn't until HIV popped in or the test became available in 1985 uh, that the, everybody became alarmed. We had a committee set up, the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland, uh, Dr. McDonald, set up a committee chaired by um, uh, Brian McClelland, who was head of the Blood Transfusion Service, because that was the other area of great concern was the blood supply. I mean, was the blood supply contaminated? The other risk group, of course, was people receiving blood transfusions. So huge pressure on the blood transfusion service to become aware of the risk of passing it on uh, by transfusing infected blood. Uh, so there was all sorts of people involved. Uh, that committee made the rather startling recommendations um, that we should have uh, a needle exchange. You know, we should supply needles and, and syringes to people who were using drugs by injecting. And that we should supply heroin. Uh, we should, sorry, uh, we should supply methadone as an alternative to the heroin that was going around. So we we had a very dramatic, very active um, scene going on, and uh, driven by the HIV concern, driven by the 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 other reason for being most concerned about this group was the link to the heterosexual population. So the specter of a heterosexual epidemic became very real. So here we were with a very hot um, virus epidemic going on, still with a continuing an epidemic, of, epidemic of heroin use and a potential epidemic of, of heterosexual transmission. Um, thanks, Siobhan. I'm going to stop there. I mean, I could obviously go on uh, for longer, but um, hopefully I'll be able to uh, talk in the question and answer session. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. That was um, really fascinating. And what's very interesting is hearing how um, uh, people started paying more attention when they saw it as being a potential heterosexual epidemic, rather than something that was affecting these marginalised communities of men who have sex with men and drug users, who clearly that people didn't care about saving the lives of nearly as much as heterosexual people in general. Oh, gosh. Um, and it really shows the role that stigma played in leading to this becoming as bad as it did. Um, what we're going to move on to now is thinking about um, treatment. And at this point, I'm going to invite to start talking um, Alistair Hudson from HIV Scotland. He, because the really good thing that's happening in Scotland is, and in various other countries around the world, is we've got this improvement of having uh, better drugs and treatment and a better future. So, Alistair, would you speak to us, please? I'll speak to you. Yeah, of course I will. <clears throat> Happy to. Thank you for having me along. And um, it was great hearing Roy and Christopher speak earlier. Um, I'm 53 years old. Um, and I never expected to live to 53 years old as a young gay man in Edinburgh in the 80s. I moved to Edinburgh in 1987, and then I moved to London in 1988. At the time when um, the AIDS epidemic was the, the big scary monster that nobody really spoke about. In some ways, it was a little bit like sending your young people to university in nine, 2020, a war zone with a different epidemic and a different disease. but. The same challenges. However, um, it's a sign as a remarkable piece of storytelling. I believe it was written with great love. I've said that many times. And it was non-apologetic. It actually represented a culture that was one that I experienced and loved. Um, it was a very profound time in many, many ways. But nowadays in Scotland, we've got an incredible positive um, treatment landscape and, um, and more importantly, political will. And that means money as well as political will. Um, a rights framework that's supportive um, in terms of treatment. I mean, nowadays we know that HIV treatment 
as prevention, which is kind of a new a new way of describing things. So, I mean, if you're living with diagnosed HIV, um, you can take highly active antiretroviral medications to prevent the onward transmission of your HIV and, um, and suppress your virus to an extent where it becomes undetectable and effectively untransmittable or transmissible. Um, transmittable is an American word um, that we don't even have here. But U equals U has been a game changer really. And for people who are vulnerable to HIV acquisition, um, we have PrEP, which is um, a uh, um, prophylaxis that can effectively prevent the acquisition of HIV. And Scotland was the first country in the UK to actually make that available. So I'm very, very proud of my beloved Bonnie Scotland for being yet again another um, game changer. And I think that is how things are looking at in the HIV prevention landscape. I mean, I was diagnosed with HIV in 2009, at a time when treatment was readily available. And for me, treatment is as simple as one tablet a day with no side effects. In fact, if you are having side effects, you're on the wrong medication. Um, and there are many options. There's, there are very, um, it's a range of um, treatments that are available. And the pipeline in terms of treatment going forward with injectables being made available for um, treatment are, are going to become readily available by monthly injections, which have got implications for people, not letting people know that they're on treatment. I mean, if you're undetectable, it changes how somebody would have to make someone aware of their HIV. The seminal moment we had to disclose legally if you're undetectable and uninfectious, that changes things completely. But the treatment options are readily available and we know that they work. Part of the work that I've done in HIV is I look after a project called the People Living with HIV Stigma Survey in the UK, which was a, a community initiative really to look at how we'd measure HIV stigma. And I think HIV stigma is described as this umbrella term that's become a bit of a catch-all for many people. And I think we have got the ability now with research to be able to really drill into that. So I think HIV stigma is gonna become a much more nuanced conversation rather than just a catch all. I mean, conversations about people double gloving and people that, um, people that use um, um, excuses like won't share cutlery or, um, or, or cups with people living with HIV um, are just limiting. And um, ultimately, just fueling the stigma that we know exists. I don't think it's useful. I think lots of those things are happening. But if somebody has double gloving, for example, it's a very bad use of the medical kit. This is me when I was 20 years old, believe it or not. Um, as I was leaving Edinburgh, I left high school in 1979. No, started, left primary school in 1979, just in the beginning of the madness that the Thatcher government was and is. So these are a list of numbers that we have. I'm not going to read numbers to you on slides because I find it tedious when people do it to me. But perhaps the most remarkable thing is UN targets from 1990 um, in Scotland, the results have been remarkable. The idea was that um, to get 90% of the people who are living with HIV um, to be diagnosed, to have 90% of them engaged in treatment and 90% of them hopefully being able to achieve a an undetectable viral load or suppressed viral load. And what we've done in Scotland is we've actually not only smashed those targets, but the numbers in Scotland um, are 92, 98 and 95. So 95% 95 of people who are living with HIV are effectively undetectable. And that's been a real game changer. But HIV can only be treated if you're aware it's present. But by the same token, it can only be transmitted if it's present. Many people have sex every day and don't wind up acquiring STIs or unplanned pregnancies. So for HIV to be transmitted, it has to be pregnant, pr pregnant, present, <laughs> pregnant. That would be impressive. Um, so I think the game changing stuff around the treatment this prevention landscape has been game changing. So testing, testing, testing. I mean, it's like it's better to know. So we are really strong advocates for testing across the sector. I think, you know, the way that I speak about it generally with young people is when you start assuming responsibility for your dental health, you know, that moment when you start going um, to the school dentist with it, your parents, you're still shitting yourself, but basically you front it and you go in. I think when you start assuming responsibility for your dental health, it may be a good way to start speaking about assuming responsibility for your sexual health and well-being so that you actually have the ability to understand your needs in a safe space, perhaps more importantly, to discuss it.
I think the thing about HIV treatment and testing, it's always been something that those people should be doing. And I think that's where it's become very limited. So we know that treatment prevention works and um, delivering treatment in Scotland is something that we do very well. And um, the data supports that. We've got a really positive um, framework for delivery and um, for treatment generally. And I think the fact that we've got PrEP now as one of the game changers means that for people that are vulnerable to acquiring HIV, because maybe there's more HIV in the population group that they come from, and um, men who have sex with men, and I include the whole spectrum of bisexuality in that, and, um, you know, MSM. Or maybe you're in a relationship whereby you're not sure of your partner's, um, you know, um, monogamy, if you're in a relationship that's open, or if you've got a range of um, partners that you're having, and good luck to you, it's better to know and really just to contemplate your prevention as part of a basket of prevention options, which might include contraception, PrEP, highly active antiretroviral medication if you are living with HIV, or condoms, I mean, everybody, or abstinence. There's a whole range of options that are available to you, and they're all valuable, and I think we need to start thinking about prevention in a context of being basket prevention I mean I'm 53 years old I don't need as much sex as I did when I was 22 thank god um, and my prevention needs have changed as I've moved through my sexual journey as well so I think the conversation for me that's interesting to support prevention is one of sexual literacy so that people can understand their sexual identity their sexual practice their sexual risk and the prevention needs and testing needs and engagement with their sexual health and well-being as a much more whole person thing rather than just being a one-stop shop where you go to the VD clinic, as it used to be called. Um, we speak about sexually transmitted infections rather than venereal diseases and the same way young people are redefining gender. So I think there's a whole opportunity and a really exciting opportunity for us to dynamically change the language that we're using in the sexual health space. And I'm really keen that HIV Scotland and organisations that we work with are going to get on that train with us. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, Alistair. That was really good. Um, um, we were hoping to have a fourth panellist who unfortunately is unable to attend to look at um, the global picture. Um, I'm going to do an incredibly light touch overview of the fact that um, globally it's we're not at this wonderful 95, 95, 95 type target. And um, a place which I am fully aware of at the moment is the Philippines has the highest rising rate of HIV infection. Um, so it has a very low number of HIV infections, but they're rising at an incredibly rapid rate. And um, in the Philippines specifically, 84% of the cases in men are from men who have sex with men. Um, and I personally think a large chunk of this is because it's a Catholic country and it's not having the same education and enlightenment and approaches that Alistair's talking about. So it's really interesting to think about what we've learned in Scotland and how that can be applied elsewhere. So from there, I am going to throw it over to you, our participants, um, for questions. Um, the nature of this slideshow and to be fair to the panelists, here is a picture of me from the 1980s being very hipster. <laughs> How do you open up tests? Because there is there is a very much a problem with um, testing being associated with with well, gay men or MSN, um, and I've always found it very difficult to try and try and get convinced straight people that they should actually be getting tested on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, I mean, I used to, I've worked in a couple of places in my bizarre meandering in my 30 years in London, back up the road. I worked with the Family Planning Association and International Planned Parenthood Federation and Brute Young People for many years, in various guises. And when I was speaking about testing to younger people, I used to speak about knowledge being power. And the more power you have, the more transactional ability you have. And um, I was saying, you know, like if, if you go to France, if you go to Paris for a weekend, it's useful to learn a few words of French. So if you're going to engage in your, your, your human experience or your sexual journey, it's useful to learn the language. And I think it just gives you more ability to be effective in that space. I think it's very interesting that when you look at testing for um, STIs or bloodborne viruses as being this thing that's a thing that those people do. I mean, 
I remember my mother used to tell the story with great delight that she had to borrow her sister-in-law's wedding when to go and get the pill. And, um, and what was probably then the Family Planning Association in Glasgow. And she told the story with great glee that she'd managed to con them into giving her the pill before she was married, because my dad and her were quite clearly not going hungry. Um, so I think, you know, that's it's a start. And I think, you know, obviously, um, statutory SRE in schools in England's becoming a, a, a game changer. It's going to become much more of a focus. And I think the same thing, the curriculum for excellence. There's certainly space for us to kind of provide high quality assets to teach young people. And then hopefully those conversations will happen in the kitchen. Mum, do you know what I learned to do at school? And then things tend to kind of seep through families. I think it's, you know, family clear. I think the stigma around it is more probably about values and attitudes rather than stigma. So I'd rather be specific about it. If somebody's homophobic or, or has a problem with what they think black people are or Muslim people are or gay women are or trans people are, it's going to percolate into how they communicate their testing and understanding and access rights. And it feels like a useful point to say that it's possible to get free testing with a testing kit that can be sent to your home in Scotland. It's a, a prick of a finger. It's not the uh, complex process that some people might think it is and um and it's free and the results are quick so it's worth people knowing that it is for uh, people people with uteruses will be aware of pregnancy tests it's more simple than that <laughs> maybe i can in invite uh christopher to uh talk a little bit about what sx <laughs> do in, the t in terms of testing because uh if i'm uh they at least used to have um, times clinics when people could come along there and they provide testing kits as well, I think. Christopher? Yeah, so um, there's often this kind of thing, what sort of offer did you have pre-pandemic to now current pandemic? But uh, pre-pandemic, we had weekly clinics in Edinburgh that were available to gay and bisexual men and all men who have sex with men. We often ran testing clinics in the university as well for student staff and everyone who felt that they wanted to be empowered following a test or get some more information and just know their status around things. Uh, we've been really helpful during the pandemic with HOVtest.scot, which was exactly what Siobhan was talking about there, but also um, providing a bit more clarity around the testing options. So the Sexual Health Centre in Edinburgh had a lot of teething issues at the start of how to get the right channels and people into testing who really needed it. But now they've got really clear defined pathways in and it's much more clear about how to access PrEP, how to get your testing and how to get into the clinics if you so need it. Thank you, thank you, that's uh, really useful. Um, I think the more um, people across the population are tested, the better um, from a personal perspective. And um, I feel quite, lucky that possibly through being lgbt plus but within this um and within my particular generation where we grew up with the tombstone adverts and everything um that i have always considered regular testing to just be part of being a responsible adult <laughs> who cares about their partners uh, yeah uh, i think there's a particular thing around how we talk about sexual health that we need to kind of change that conversation because exactly the tombstone advert is a particular one that's always the negative always focus on what's bad if you don't do this this will be bad if you do this you'll have this horrible picture that you were shown in science class but i think we need to start talking about sexual health in a much broader sense about it's about how do you have a healthy relationship how do you have good sex and how is sexual health part of that as well and it is all together so people feel a bit more empowered through their process rather than going to a clinic out of fear but one out of responsibility for them and their partners. Um, one of my uh, big questions is, I saw on the figures that um, in Scotland, we've now reached again a point where it's um, men who have sex with men who are the highest risk group. And I was wondering if Roy wanted to comment on um, if he sees um, HIV as something that's happening with the drug using population anymore, or if that has now moved to other countries as being more of an issue. Yeah, well, it's a good question, isn't it? I mean, we always, um, I mean, down to testing. I mean, if you don't test, you don't know. And uh, I mean, I do worry that we're poor at testing. You know, um, we're not very good at uh, bringing it up. We think it's not there, so we don't bother testing. And that became apparent with hepatitis C when 
it became we became aware there'd been a, a subsequent or a, a, a collateral epidemic of hepatitis C, and we suddenly started testing people and finding all these positives. I mean, I think in a lot of our drug using population in Edinburgh, it isn't the prevalence is low of HIV infection, and that is shown in the national figures, with the one exception of this epidemic we've had in Glasgow over the last three or four years. Um, amongst the, the homeless drug using population in the centre of Glasgow, uh, where there has now been up to, I think it's maybe up to 200 cases, which is a real, is really shocking, you know, in this day and age when we thought we were delivering good harm reduction, uh, we thought we were engaging people in treatment, we thought we were supplying needles and syringes, we thought we, you know, people were getting, you know, were becoming more knowledgeable about, uh, about the risks of sharing. Uh, but we've had an epidemic of HIV in, in, in central Glasgow, which is still going on. I mean, it's not stopped and it's spread out to North Lanarkshire and it's um, around, this, around about Glasgow. So uh, there, there, the, the possibilities are that we will have more HIV and I think it will go on at a, a low level. And we don't have the, I mean, that, that represented a little bit like the shooting galleries in the early 1980s a large population or a large age population living in close quarters and interacting with each other. Whereas a lot of our drug users nowadays in Edinburgh and I think in other cities in Scotland tend to inject, but tend to inject in smaller groups and smaller communities. So the possibility of epidemic spread is less, um, but it's, it's still there. It's still, you know, it's still a worry and um, it's something we should be aware of and we should be doing everything we can to prevent. I mean, we, we could go on to talk about safer injecting rooms, which I think is is one of the the, the missing parts of our our um, you know our, our delivery service of services. But uh, maybe somebody else will want to bring that up. Fantastic! I am now just looking at some of the other questions, um, and someone, uh, a couple of people have been asking about how people are asking about how we've reduced stigma if stigma has been reduced, uh, what the nuance is and um, what we can do about that. Um, happy to answer that. Um, how do we reduce stigma? We get to understand it um, and get specific about it. In the same way, getting specific about where um, treatment um, needed to be targeted and testing needed to be targeted. I mean, everybody, the Don't Die of Ignorance campaign was kind of brutal and it's now taught in media studies as scorch and burn, not the way to do a campaign. <laughs> However, in terms of public health, I mean, it did actually reduce significantly the projected numbers of deaths that we we're going to see and enthused a lot of kind of safer sex behaviours. It's a brutal way to do it, but in terms of game changing, and then on the back of that, things come out of it like needle exchanges and harm reduction programmes, which were world leading and set up in this country, but have that have now become global models for excellence. I think around injecting drug use, it's kind of maybe changed shape slightly. Um, chemsex, emerging trends around that, how people are using crystal meth and pleasure, and it's conversations that are not being had in the mainstream, but you know, early adapters tend to become mainstream in time. So I think it's just a case of being agile enough to be responsive and responsible to the emerging trends that we know and certainly um, have awareness of. I think with regards to stigma, a lot of the layered stuff around it, internalized stigma, I'm not going to go to that because I think they think, you know, how stigma behaves when you internalise it rather than the obvious discriminatory behaviours, which are much more visible and easy to understand. So I think, you know, this blanket stigma, bad, acceptance, good, um, just isn't cutting it anymore for me. So I really want to be specific when we speak about stigma. That's really, really great. Thank you, Alistair. That's a really nice way of talking about it. And in fact, I'm just going to follow on and say that someone just said, as as a mention, um, that they really wanted to thank you for saying how it felt as a gay man that you wouldn't see old age because they're, they're 53 as well and was in Edinburgh 1985 to 1990 and had forgotten that moment and that feeling and um, had asked me to pass that on. So I have. <laughs> um, Can I just say, Siobhan, about just on the stigma thing, just briefly. I mean, we, we all do these courses on bias, you know, in the universities, and we have to pass a, a little test on bias. And it's really quite revealing when you think you're not biased against, you know, this or that community or this or that issue. Um, you suddenly realise you are, and it's unconscious bias, you know. And I think stigma exists at all levels, like Christopher was saying. 
Um, it's, sometimes it's blindingly obvious and it's, you know, it's really hostile, but, but a lot of it's endemic and it's ingrained in the system. And I think stigma exists at all levels. You know, I think the stigma within the Scottish government against um, some populations and the stigma within you know, institutions and organizations. And I, I think that's very difficult to even to identify and much more difficult to bring to people's awareness. And I think it is about education, uh, but I think we've also got to challenge it as well. And I think we spend in the drug using stigma community issues, we talk a lot to, politicians and I don't know if they get it, you know, they don't get it that, I mean, they, they, there was a cutback before the last Scottish election of 30% in mental health services, which is extraordinary. I mean, absolutely breathtaking that they could make that and still win the election by a landslide. Um, if they'd done that in, you know, in cardiology or geriatrics or care of the elderly, you know, there would have been a revolution, but, you know, the drug users, the stigma at all levels and in all sorts that, of applications. That's really interesting. In fact, um, one of the questions we've had in the Q&A is about your own attitudes. Did you have attitudes towards drug users, you and your colleagues, that you had to address in order to start managing this? This is from Jocelyn, who is a junior doctor. Oh, Jocelyn, that's cruel. That's, um, that's um, tricky, isn't it? You know, confronting your own biases and your own... Um, attitudes is much more difficult than trying to blame others, isn't it? Um, but yeah, there's, there's no doubt at the beginning, um, way back in the 1980s, nobody really was terribly sure what was going on. And, and this population that we were dealing with, it seemed like a, a pretty difficult group, you know, and, um, uh, and relationships were not always easy or not always good. Um, and, and, and to a certain extent, that's still true. And the difference for, well, the difference now for us is it's still a hugely illegal, it's a criminal justice issue. So here we are dealing with something that's illegal and that we are being drawn into. And we are having to share the risk of this illegal, um, illegal activity. And I think it's part of our job as, as medics and doctors and nurses to share risks with people. And I think we do have a responsibility to take on some of that risk sharing. And that includes uh, pushing the criminal um, sector or the, the justice sector and saying, okay, you know, we're prepared to initially give people needles and syringes when it was against the law. Uh, we were prepared to do that. Um, and the Lord Advocate once said to me that, you know, he could easily find several laws that we were breaking um, and you know, there could be consequences, but he wasn't going to because, you know, for various reasons. Um, but, but I think at the beginning, in answer to Jocelyn's question, um, it, was, it is difficult, but I was very proud, I must say, of our practice staffing and juniors and nobody ran away from it. Nobody said they wouldn't deal with it. Nobody resigned, nobody that I know of, nobody um, said that they wouldn't manage somebody with HIV infection or they wouldn't. And, and I'm very proud of it. I think that is fantastic, particularly considering the attitudes that people were describing at the time. Um, as I'm aware that we're coming up to seven o'clock and the sort of ending of this session, I'm going to do three more questions if people are happy. Uh, one of the questions, and it might be Alistair can speak to this as he was in Edinburgh <laughs> in the 80s. Um, someone was wondering if anyone had any information about whether there were instances of direct action or protests around HIV AIDS in Scotland in the 80s and 90s by organisations such as Scottish AIDS Monitor or similar. I cannot see Alistair. <laughs> um, I'm happy to talk. I know from some of the stuff that Women Care has done, it's kind of always been about raising the attention and different things through that. And I know that there was quite a lot of red ribbing campaigning outside the playhouse for a while during the early 90s that um, massively involved in spreading awareness but i'm not sure if as the scale of it's a sin so not the uh, mass protest um i think it was interesting um i know from my own experience that the um 80s and 90s and um as someone has pointed out in the chat edinburgh had an act up group which began in 1989 so ACT UP is a, a protest group that sort of advocates for people in those groups. Um, and it's also worth noting that the Red Ribbon campaign was actually massive for those who are younger in the late 80s and the early 90s. Um, 
if you had cable TV or Sky or something, you had MTV, almost all the adverts in the run up to the 1st of December had red ribbons in them. Uh, World AIDS Day was something that people actually paid attention to very, very heavily. Um, and it was a real sort of cultural moment where people were trying to, um, in much the way that uh, young people now are speaking up for people who are oppressed as allies, a lot of people were speaking up for the people, people with HIV and AIDS not receiving enough treatment as allies at that time, which is how, just as an incidental side story, I ended up at 15 years old walking down the stairs to my incredibly Catholic mother who met my father when they were both missionaries wearing a t-shirt that said properly used a condom prevents against HIV, AIDS and other sexually transmitted infections, which led to the talk. Um, we'll go to some more questions. Um, we've had someone ask about uh, rural areas. So they're coming from a rural area and they say that apparently there's still quite a high level of stigma based on lack of education and culture, stereotypical gender roles and reinforcement. Uh, people feeling comfortable accessing services and being afraid to be outed in close-knit communities. For example, I know of someone who had a similar issue on one of the island communities. I was very careful not to specify which island. <laughs> Any ideas on education programmes, particularly in the care setting, um, and for those who are ageing and possibly require residential care in the future? Because there seems to be a poor understanding in that sector. I would come in and say Waverley Care um, has lots of operations all over Scotland. So we have services available in Forth Valley, Argyll and View in Inverness and the Highlands as well. So there's many things we do around educational programmes with local work settings, particularly in Highland, but also about supporting people to live well with HIV. And both the Waverley Care website, the Essex website, which is specifically for gay and bisexual men, are huge information banks that people can access and both of them have a live chat function on that people can um, access anonymously to get information and possible referrals anywhere in Scotland. Fantastic. Um, we've also had a question about the availability and uptake of PREC, PrEP um, and it, do, whether speakers think there is enough research going on with regard to there being a vaccine. Uh, Christopher, I think that's going to be you again. Um, I'm not too sure about vaccine wise, but um, I know PrEP has been really, really a massive boost in Scotland, particularly for gay and bisexual men and men who have sex with men. And I think uh, one of the main things to consider as well is that the access is because I think it's majority accessed by gay and bisexual men. Um, but the thing is that isn't across the board in particularly rural areas where people find it difficult to access, but in urban areas, it's definitely been accessed in them. And we've seen the two year implementation report that came out where it was a 20% drop in new infections in that community. So it's been highly, highly successful. Also for just starting a new conversation because as well for once it became the ownership on the person who was HIV negative in the relationship that was also part and parcel of reducing that onward transmission. So with, as Alistair said earlier, undetectable equals untransmissible and PrEP, there's actually a kind of unity about two people's ability to have a kind of impact on the spread of HIV in the community. So I think it's a really interesting thing that, that it's now less about, um, it's sort of a, a situation that goes for, um, say, women who have sex with men is that it's assumed that because they're the one with the uterus, they're the ones who should worry about being pregnant. And it's like, oh, if you've got AIDS, you should care about whether you give it to me. I shouldn't care about looking after my own part in that. So the idea that the person who's HIV negative cares about doing prep and doing those things to look after themselves, it makes the idea that it's much more about both people bringing something to it and having a responsibility for that act, which I think is a, a part of a, a much broader conversation about healthy attitudes towards sex. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think one of the biggest things about PrEP that's going to be much further research going on about it is actually how it's built on people's sexual confidence and reduce their anxiety around sex as well. And um, specifically, Waverley Care has an African health project based in Edinburgh and Glasgow. And there's a big move in there to express access to PrEP for those communities as well, where possibly sex is a harder conversation between relationships. And it allows a person to have confidence that they have PrEP so they won't be putting themselves at risk of getting HIV from a partner. But um, I think in terms of sexual confidence and also reducing that anxiety, a lot of gay men speak about it 
as the spectre of AIDS from the 80s hanging over their shoulder whenever they have sex. And for the, for the new generations, that's PrEP can reduce that anxiety and kind of bring that life back to it as well. Hopefully undo some of the harm of those tombstone adverts. Um, I'm going to give one final question, which is going back to the drug uh, use element. Um, someone has asked about how we legalise work like that from Peter Krykant, a drug and worker, alcohol worker and activist who did a mobile drug consumption fan so that people could carry out supervised injections. And is that the a, a, a route that we want to follow? And how do we make that accessible and legal? Because um, one of the things that's come up, I think, is that it was interesting that AIDS became apparent. I think it would have been harder to treat if sex, if men having sex with men was still illegal. It would have been much harder to address it in that community. And obviously, drug use is still illegal. Right, is that for me, Siobhan? Yes. We've got an hour and a half to talk about decriminalization. <laughs> I think we have about 15 minutes. <laughs> so you've got to admire activists in the, you know, in, the, in the supporting people who are using injectable drugs and, you know, that, that activity last week. You've got to admire it, but it does represent a failure of the system, doesn't it? Uh, when somebody has got to, you know, make their own, uh, fund their own project to um, manage people who are beleaguered and, you know, on, on the edge and really taking their lives and great risk every time, every day. Um, I mean, it's a, I think it's it's a it's a sign of a failed system, and it's a, it, you know, we wouldn't expect people with any other disease to be accessing uh, an agency that was um, that was unsupported and was um, you know was funded by you know by a, a very shaky foundation. Um, so I, I think it it just it just points to the absence of proper services. And the absence in this case is of, of safer injecting rooms. I mean, there's probably 10 European countries that have uh, many injecting rooms. I mean, 38 in, in um, Germany alone, um, and very well documented evidence that these safer injecting rooms are very effective. And when you visit them, I mean, they're just a clinic. I mean, they're not sort of um, dangerous, wild places with with sort of crazy people in them. They are. It's just like a I mean, a bit medical, but it's uh, it's run in most countries as a medical service. And the and the heroin injecting facility in Glasgow, I don't know if anybody's visited it. I mean, it's, it's excellent. It's really good. Um, and it's an example of what can be done. But it's terribly bureaucratic and terribly um, constrained by home office regulations. And, you know, the tiny amount of heroin they actually have on site has got to be kept in a safe with, you know, it, it's like Fort Knox. I mean, it's... It's bizarre, you know. It, it's just another medical treatment, and I, I, so I think it, it represents a failure in the system. And I think it's a disgrace that we haven't really taken this forward, and we haven't um, got a, a, a safer injecting facility in every city in Scotland. It, I mean, it doesn't have to be hugely expensive. It doesn't have to be, you know, massively funded. It just has to be part of, you know, whatever service we have in our hospitals or in communities. Fantastic. So I would like to thank everyone who's come. Our panellists have been amazing. And um, before we leave, I would like to return to a mention of the fact that HIV Scotland, the programme that they are running is something called Generation Zero. So that's Generation Zero. And um, the aim is to get to 2030, which feels really soon now, <laughs> to have um, basically zero stigma, zero new cases and zero uh, transmissions which means that we're and it feels within reach i would say which is quite exciting and um, um we can just hope that that comes to other parts of the world so i would like to say thank you to our panelists alistair hudson from hiv scotland the ceo of hiv scotland professor roy robertson and christopher ward from waverly care and I'd also like to thank our organisers and supporters, uh, the BioQuarter LGBT Plus Staff Committee. Uh, that's Jen Durkin, Gareth Hardesty and Catherine Milonis, who, without, who came up with some fantastic speakers. Um, it was actually two separate events that we joined together to create this. And it's fantastic what we've achieved.
Jane Valentine at Our Story Scotland, who provided the Derek Ogg audio, and Henry Gray at HIV Scotland, who helped us with this and with the previous event that this was a follow-on from. So, and also to thank you all for attending. Thank you so much. Um, I have really enjoyed this event and I hope you have too. <laughs>